You know, one of the first things they teach you, well, they used to, back in the good old days, when you were going to be a teacher, if you wanted to get the class's attention, you know what you did? You shut up. You didn't say a word. And when you didn't say a word, they finally figured out, well, it's about time I shut up. But uh, glad you're here this morning. We're glad to have our long, long travelers, Melanie and Dave, back from out of the country. We're glad you guys are back this morning. I know you had a great time because we saw all the pictures. I'm not sure David did much work, but <laughs> there was a lot of pictures of the beach and palm trees. I know that. So it's good. Uh, you remember the song that Ed just got finished playing? Yes, absolutely. What was it? What a day. What a day that will be. So the first thing we're going to do is get in the roll call. So that's what we're going to sing this morning. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saint of earth shall gather over on the other shore. And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise. And the glory of his resurrection share When the chosen one shall gather to their home beyond the skies And the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is caught up yonder When the roll is caught up yonder When the roll is caught up somebody and welcome them this morning. some people today from um, from Central Asia. They're called the Pashtun people or the Pactan or Hindonistan people. Um, they are known as the Persian Afghans. Um, they're an ethno-linguistic group that resides primarily in the region that lies uh, between the Hindu Kush in northeastern Afghanistan and a northern stretch of the Hindu River in Pakistan. Um, you been there? 
<laughs> Close to it. All right. So population is 53 million people. Uh, they primarily speak Pashto language. Um, they are uh, part of the Sunni Islam. Uh, that's the code that they go by um, that governs them. The origins are debated of where they came from. Um, even amongst themselves, they debate on where they come from. One tradition says that the Pashtun people are descendants of a man by the name of Afghani, or Afghana, which you can find in your Bible because he was a descendant, a uh, grandson of King Saul. So it's interesting that they are connected somehow with the Jewish people. Um, several of the tribes are known to have moved from Afghanistan to Pakistan, um, and most of them are farmers, um, and all of them, all, the majority of the men serve in the military, um, and some of them will hold political posts. But you can read in here about a little bit about them. They identify with their, with their religion. They're very loyal. Uh, they're a very honor uh, society. Uh, they're very hospitable uh, as well. But we also know that there are many, many, many of them that don't know the Lord. But they are being scattered around the world. And as they begin to be scattered around the world, they have opportunities to hear the gospel. And so our prayer is that they will hear the gospel and be reawakened or awakened to the truth of the gospel so that they can know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. So let's pray for the Pashtun people of Central Asia. Father, thank you for the opportunity that you give us to pray for these people. Each and every week we are um, coming to know different groups of people in our church all over this world so that we can think more globally than we do just locally. And that we can focus on this group of people this week and pray for them specifically, these the, these Pashtun people, um, Lord of Afghanistan and Pakistan and, and the surrounding areas, Lord, I pray for um, just for your spirit to work in their hearts. They are listening to uh, the lies of Islam and Hindu, and Father, I pray that they would hear the truth um, and that it, it would break through, the light would break through the darkness into their hearts and that they, you would soften their hearts. And, and, and help them to see the truth of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your love to us. And I thank you that you have given us your son, Jesus, who loves us so much. May we be willing to give him away to all these people that we come in contact with or that we're praying for. Lord, that we just continue to speak the name of Jesus to them. Because it is the only name that can save. And we thank you for that. Thank you for your love in Jesus' name. Before I forget it, before Virgie and, and Hannah uh, punch me in the ribs and tells me not to forget it, <laughs> Friday evening at 6.30, I like it when she's, yeah, you got it right. We're, we're going to have an operation crystal shot meeting here. If you've been making things, if you could bring them so others that sew might show up as well. And fundraising this year for shipping shipping costs have gone up. We haven't heard, but we figure it'll probably go up. It will, yes, it'll probably go up. So we're going to have to, if we're going to do 1,500 boxes again this year, it's going to be, it's going to be shipping is going to be out of this world. We may, we may, yeah, we we may have to get Scott to go to the National Guard and get us a C-130. If it, you know, we can pack them on a plane, we just take them ourselves, but. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, if you heard uh, the message last week, um, we talked about how you learn more about Jesus, and how Peter said that was one of the, that was one of the chains of our way to heaven was learning more about Jesus. 
This is an old, old hymn. Some of you may not stand. Some of you may stand. Over here, it may be a little silent over here. But that's okay. They learned it this morning. But listen to this song. It's got a lot of good words to it. More about Jesus would I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. It's a good rocking song. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. I wish you could see the sight that I see up here. We're singing that song, and everybody that's got a baby in their hands is going. <laughs> Just like this. It's a great song, it's a great rocking song, and it's got a lot of truth to it. On the second verse. More about Jesus, let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be. Showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness. More of his love who died for me. More about Jesus on his throne. Rich in glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase. More of his coming prince of peace. More, more about Jesus. Tell me more, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. I don't know if you've heard about uh, things that's happened in Kentucky in the past week about the revival at Asbury College about 200 I guess it's about up to 230 240 hours of nothing but revival at this point and it spread from Asbury to Lee College to Cedarville uh, Hannah's got noticed today that they're going to have a start at Marshall on Monday at 5 o'clock in the Student Center at Marshall. So there's awakening coming among our young people. Amen. What's the matter with us old people? Yes. We need revived just as much as those young. And, the, and it all started by one person coming up front and repenting of their sin. And the rest of it has been no sermons, no pre it's all been praise and worship. Praise and worship and singing and music and testimonies. That's all it's been. And it's because of God's amazing grace. But for your grace, I would go my way. I'm forever grateful that you have been faithful to me, Lord, for your amazing grace. But for your grace, I could not be saved.
that saved a wretch like me. God's riches at Christ's expense. He paid it all so that we can have eternal life. Grace. He gives us grace. And not only grace, He gives us mercy. And gives us that hope of eternal life. But for your grace I could not be saved, but for your grace I would go my way. I'm forever grateful that you have been faithful to me, Lord, for your
show's over, we shall wear a crown. Yes, we shall wear a crown. Yes, we shall wear a crown. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown in the new Jerusalem. Wear a crown. Wear a crown. Wear a bright and shining crown. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown in the new Jerusalem. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Children are dismissed. Children and their teachers. Nice. Second uh, Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. We are going to talk today about final words. Final words on matters of first importance. Final words on matters of first importance. Because final words are important. How important are they? Well, they're very important. When you drop your child off at school, you tell them, the last thing you might tell them is, don't forget. That I am not going to pick you up tonight. You have to ride the bus home. Don't forget. Your boss may say, to do something, and that's his last words he gives to you as he heads off on a special vacation to Puerto Rico. One of the joys of being a youth pastor was we got to attend more graduation ceremonies than I ever cared to mention. And they had some great speakers. And they had some not so great speakers. And one of the first, no, the first one we went to uh, in Ohio, um, our kids wanted us to come. Um, our, our kids, our young people wanted us to come. Um, and they wanted their parents to be all be there because they had told them for years about this teacher and how boring he was. And so they asked him to be their graduation speaker. And I don't remember much about that speech because it was truly boring. But I do remember this about that speech. That he began and talking about different people that had made, historical people that had made a contribution to society. And before he said that name, and at the end, after he talked about that person, he said this phrase, and this is all I remember about it, remember the name. That's all. I don't remember anybody that he talked about except for one person. Can you guess who that is? Jesus. He talked about Jesus as being a rabbi, a teacher, an educator, but not as being the Son of God. Final words are important. Final words communicate things of first importance. And I, su I suppose that's why um, the church over the years has placed special significance on the last words of her leaders. When Samuel Rutherford was on his deathbed, someone was close by with a pen to record his dying words, and in them he said, Dear brethren, do all for me. Pray for Christ. Preach for Christ. Do all for Christ. Beware of men-pleasing. The chief 
shepherd will shortly appear. Those are pretty good words. John Wesley said this, The best of all is God is with us. And then his final word was farewell. Lyle Dorset, who is an able historian and loved Jesus, talked about being there when the great evangelist Dwight L. P Moody um, was saying his final words. He, said, he says this, The ailing preacher roused from sleep and in slow measure words announced, quote, Earth recedes, heaven opens for me. Dorset goes on to speak of various family members coming to his bedside to receive final instructions. But those words resounded with him. Earth recedes. Heaven opens for me. Then there are some others uh, that were, were Christian but not in the church so much. But John Bacon, who was an English sculptor, he died in 1799. He said this, What I was as an artist seemed to be of some importance while I lived, but what I really was as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is the only thing of importance to me. That's pretty significant. Because a lot of times we as men define ourselves by what we do and not who we are. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, American educator and, po and poet who died in 1882, said, For the Christian, the grave itself is but a covered bridge leading from light to light through a brief darkness. And maybe one of my, my favorite famous word quotes came from Polycarp, a disciple of the Apostle John who died as a Christian martyr sometime between 155 and in about, or in about 155, said this, Leave me as I am. The one who gives me strength to the endure the fire will also give me strength to stay quiet still on the, on the pyre, even without the precaution of your nails. For 80 and 6 years, I have been his servant, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? I love that. John Knox, a Scottish clergyman and leader of the Protestant Reformation, is considered to be found, the founder of the Presbyterians, who bloody Queen Mary once said that she feared the prayers of John Knox more than all of the armies in Scotland. On his deathbed, said, Live in Christ, and the flesh need not fear. We come today to some of the final words of, of Peter. <clears throat> the New Testament scholar Douglas Moo, I love that last name, Moo, he commented on 2 Peter and he said this, Many scholars classify it as a testament, or at least think that it has been of the characteristic of a testament, a book or a part of a book in which a person makes a final speech from his or her de deathbed. And he gives five things, and I didn't put this up there, but if you want to write them down and you know how shorthand, you'll get these five. Um, these are typical features of a last testament, okay? Because we all, we all are familiar with last wills and testaments. This is usually what he's referring to with Peter. Uh, the first one is the speaker knows, sometimes by prophecy, that he is about to die. He knows that he is about to die. The second one is the speaker gathers around him his children, his family, or a similar audience. <clears throat> the third one is the speaker often impresses on his audience the need for his hearers to remember his teaching as a final example. The, third, the fourth one is the speaker makes predictions about the future. <clears throat> And the fifth one is the speaker gives moral exhortations. So while the parable, uh, the parallels between Second Peter and other uh, 
first century final testaments are not exact. There are, there are enough similarities to allow us to think of Peter's letter as a last testament. Like Moody, Peter has come to terms with the fact that he is about to die. And heaven will soon be open to him. Knowing that the church is being, been, being and has been persecuted for years now, and that the church cannot gather at his bedside, Peter is going to pen these last words uh, as an effort to put his final testament down on paper. And these final words in Second Peter, no doubt, were meant to convey what is important. And so if we look back at the first part of chapter 1, we see what's important to him is his salvation. What is important to him is his salvation. What is also important to him is his assurance of his salvation. There's no doubting in him. He knows where he's going. And so with that, we see the, the outline of these three chapters. We see that he has faith's conviction. He is convicted that he is saved and he's going to heaven. Then there's faith's contention in chapter 2, and the third thing would be faith's consummation. Last week, Brother Fred taught us through Peter's word that our faith must add. Our faith must add. We must add virtue. We must add knowledge. We must add self-control. We must add perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness and love. Today in our scripture, we're going to add to that. We're going to see what he talks about as he says that. So stand with me, please, as we read 2 Peter chapter 1. Um, and as we've been doing, I'll read the odd, and you can read the even from the New King James Version or off the board. All right? Starting verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. <clears throat> as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge. Knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brother, be even more diligent to make the call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts.
for prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Father, have your way in our hearts and lives today. Minister to us, minister through us, help us to set aside all of the thoughts that we have and just focus on who you are and how great you are this morning. Thank you for loving us, Father. I pray for the salvation of anyone in here who does not truly know you, Father. And God will give you all the praise because you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. You can be seated. Our, our verses we're going to look at today are 12 through 15. Verses 12 through 15, if you want to look at them with me. He says, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. So, as I talked about er, earlier about that man that gave that speech, what did he use? And any good teacher is going to use it, and that's repetition. You're going to say things over and over and over again because you want your students, you want the people that, are, that you're talking to, you want them to remember something. I remember one thing, from two things from that man that spoke. First of all, Actually, I, know, I remember three things now I think about it. First of all, he was truly boring, and those poor students. Secondly, he gave a phrase that I still remember to this day, and that was 30-some years ago. That was a long time ago. Uh, that was when Fred was just a boy. Uh, and, it, and it was 30-some years ago, and I still remember, remember the name. And the third thing is that I, re I remember from that thing is he had no idea who Jesus Christ truly was, um, and that was sad. Um, and so we talk about that repetition researchers have shown that if I if you get if somebody gives you a spoken message okay you will go out of here today and you will forget 90% of what what I've talked about you will forget 90% of what I talk about God knew that he knew that we are the type of people that remember something for a short time and then it's gone yeah you with me I mean, how many times have you told, did you tell your child, don't do this, and they still do it? There were times where we would tell our children, hey, did you guys know such and such happens when such and such happens? And they're like, oh. And then, amazing thing would take place. They would go to church, and they would get in their youth group, and the youth pastor would say the very same thing that we had said. And you know what they would say? Dad, did you know Darren told us? Really? Where did you go? Where did he get that common sense from? It's amazing. And before we get on our kids, we need to look at ourselves because we're the same way. Especially us men, our wives tell us things and we forget about them. Not me, not Fred, but all of the rest of you guys. God knew that. That's why he told the, the Israelite people, he said this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. These words which I am command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in the house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Why did God do that? So they would remember. Because God knows we have a way of forgetting things. And in spite of all of those warnings, all of those reminders, the children of Israel would move away from truth and living close to God and do their own thing. Israel, as a nation, had a poor memory for God's truth. And then when Isaiah heard about it, he said this, For you have forgotten the God of your salvation. You have not remembered the rock of your refuge. God gave them a sign. He gave them the Passover to remind them of, of what he was about to do and what he was, who he was about to send to be the Passover lamb. 
Here's the sign. And for centuries and for years, every year, they have continually held, held the Passover. But they don't look at and remember the one who died for them in their place. They look at the one that God gave them and how he rescued them from Egypt in the Exodus. And even as believers, we tend to remember things that are better forgotten and to forget things that should be remembered. And Paul writes these words, and you look at chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, or Peter says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both, both. I'm trying to stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. I'm trying to remind you the things that are really, truly important. If you continue on in the New Testament, you'll see Jude saying the same thing. Remember, remember the words that were spoken beforehand. Remember, remember, remember. Where did, why are they telling us that? Because it's the same thing that Jesus said. It's the same thing that Jesus said. Hey, when you partake of this Lord's Supper, remember the things that I've done for you. Remember the things that I've done for you. Remember the words that I have said to you. And Peter uses the word remind or recall uh, three times in these, these, these verses. He's reminding us of what Fred talked about last week and the importance of having a good, godly, Christian character and living the way that we should be living because our world needs to see it today. And in this passage, Peter digresses from his subject of salvation, and he's going to drop in here a statement about reminding us of essential truth. Jesus had called Peter, and three times he had told him, Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And in these last words, Peter is going to be reminding himself and us of what we are to do. And the motivations that we need to have. And he's going to give us four motivations that reveals his passion. Four things, urgency, kindness, faithfulness, and brevity. The first one is urgency. Verse 12, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you. I will not stop reminding you. Spurgeon has said it is the very joy of this earthly life to think that it will, that it will come to an end. Paul says it a little differently. He says that every single one of us, every single one of us have a meeting with death. We, every day we are appointed to die. One day we were, there's an appointment for us, every single one of us. And so Peter begins and he says, for or therefore. That refers back to verses 1 through 12, the great salvation that we're given and the great assurance that we're given. Themes so crucial. Those things that must not be forgotten. Peter says, I don't want my readers to forget that we're saved nor the blessings that we get in salvation so he says for this reason I will not, not be negligent to remind you always remind you always what's he going to remind us of always be ready always be ready remind us that we should be anticipating the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ should be anticipating going to heaven and being with him contrary to the beliefs of some there is no such thing as brand new spiritual truth
even the new truths that they're teaching today in liberal colleges are not new. Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, and in there he said, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything comes back to what God gave us, truth, and what Satan gave us, lies. God's truths are timeless, and they are found in the Word of God. People do not always know the truth of Scripture, nor do they always hear true and accurate interpretations of Scripture. Therefore, some in that condition may think certain truth is new, and it may be new to them, but it is not a new truth. I remember growing up, and I'm thinking as I go to go to church, and I'm 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 going to church as a teenager, and I've heard the gospel, 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 and I've heard the gospel because my pastor always preached the gospel every time, and I said, man, Lord, it'd really be nice to hear something new. So I went to church, and we had a guest speaker. I was like, oh, maybe we'll hear something new. This will be really good. And you know what he gave us? The gospel. Why? Because that is the only thing that can save you. That is the only thing that matters. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That he he loved you so much, he came here, he died, he lived, he died for your sin. He was buried, he rose again from the grave, and he is living now and seated at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for you. That's it. Let's go home. Second Peter and Jude both vividly illustrate that principle. There is divine scripture that has been given to us. It is the gospel, and we need to present it. We need to talk about it. It's the same story. You talk about it all the time. It's the same story. It comes in different ways, but it's the same story. Jesus repeated his messages in sermons and his parables and object lessons. Everywhere he went, exposing those people to the truth over and over and over and over again. Why? Because he knew that the disciples didn't get it the first time or the second time or the third time or the fourth time or the fifth time. So why does the pastor keep doing that? Because he knows that the sheep are just like the disciples and they don't get it the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, the 500th time. So we keep doing it. Why? Because there is an urgency We are living in the last days. And it may not be the last days, it may be the last hours. And we need to have with an urgency the gospel on our lips to share with people that we love so dearly. And even those people that we don't like so dearly. We need to share the gospel with them because it is the only thing that saves Listen, you say, well, I don't know about that, Pastor Kevin. I don't think we're living in the last days. Listen to me. I don't know much, but I know what Jesus said. And in Matthew chapter 24, he defines what the last of the last days are going to look like. And if you don't believe me, look at Jesus and what he said at the first part of Matthew 24 when he says, look, there's going to be, in the last days, there's going to be people that are going to try and deceive you. I don't know if you know this or not, But you are being told that the water in Ohio is clean. The air is breathable. Then I have a question for those people that are saying that. Why are all those people wearing hazmat suits, number one? And number two, if you're saying it, why in the world aren't you up there drinking the water and smelling the air? You're lying. Stop lying. Those lies are just the tip of an iceberg. Anything my government tells me I do the opposite. I can't believe anything they say. And that little girl that's their press secretary? I'm not even Jewish and I say oy vey when she gets up there. Listen, we are being lied to. Then there's wars and rumors of war. It's coming all over the place. 
We got balloons that are being shot down. Little kids science project got shot down. He's crying. We don't know anything because you know what? They're not showing us any video of what really happened. And so until I see it with my own eyes and I experience it, I'm not going to believe anything that I'm, I'm being told. Why? Because I know that in the last days there's going to be deceivers. I know in the last days there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. I know in the last days there's going to be pestilence, there's going to be famines, there's going to be earthquakes. Since that earthquake hit Turkey, 5.7, 5.8, whatever it was, since that time there have been over 5,000 aftershocks. There's been earthquakes all over the ring of fire, if you're familiar with that. They're all over, all over. This earth is shaking. God is trying to get our attention. And one of the other things that God tells us is there will be a reawakening or a revival in the church. Oh, is that happening? Yeah. You know what revival is? Revival is for the church. Reawakening is for the world. God is trying to do both. Not trying. God is doing both of those. He is reviving the church, and he is reawakening the world to who he really is. It tells us that there will be an outpouring of the Spirit of God. Why do we pray for people all over this world? Because there are millions and millions and millions of people who are unsaved. And we can't go to them, so let's pray for them. Amen? Amen. So the first thing we need to have is an urgency. Peter says, I don't want you to forget. Don't forget what God has done for you. And don't forget what God is doing for you right now. Second thing is, there's a kindness. Look at re the rest of verse 12. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and you are established in the present truth. Peter understood and exhibited sensitivity to the flock. He was kind to them, he was gentle, he was meek, he was tender. Peter displayed when he acknowledged that his readers already possessed godly virtue. You know the gospel. You know the gospel, he says. I just want to remind you in these last words that I have to give to you that you need to live the gospel. You need to live the gospel. And so he's encouraging them. He's not being condescending, condescending or indifferent to them. He's showing them the love of Christ. The readers of this letter undoubtedly had heard other inspired New Testament writers and preached, uh, preached and read to them, so they knew and believed the truth. And he says, listen, it's been established in you. The word established is the word stereizo. It means to firmly establish or to strengthen. It means it has been settled. It is done. You have come to know Jesus. You have the gospel in you. It is done. It is settled. It is established. They had given evidence of their faithfulness that the true gospel was present with them. And Peter affirms this. Turn over to second, I'm sorry, turn over to Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one. Peter is basically just echo, echoing here what Paul wrote to the Colossians. And he's affirming without a doubt that these people are mature, genuine believers in Jesus. And he says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says, We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. Why? Because of the hope which is laid up for you, where? In heaven of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world, and it's bringing forth fruit as it is, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. He says basically in verse 3, because of the hope which is laid up in you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. He's saying that has been established in you and now because it's established in you, you become mature and now you are being fruitful for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where most of you are today. When someone comes to Jesus Christ, the truth abides within him. In the form of the Holy Spirit. 
And it was still important that Peter's readers receive this reminder because of a threat for their own lives, a persecution that was about to come upon them, and because they were being infiltrated by false teachers. By false teachers. So we see there's an urgency to remember the truth and tell others the truth. And then there's a, an urgency there. And then there's a second, there's a shepherd needs to be kind. And he needs to show kindness to his sheep as they're learning and growing. And even when they're failing. But Peter gives us the third one. He says, the third thing that we need to have and the third passion that he had was faithfulness. Look at verse 13. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you. Peter was recognized as being the leader of the apostles. He lived in close, and, and really closer than the other uh, apostles, more consistent uh, proximity to Jesus than any of the other apostles. He lived closer to divine truth than any of us ever will because he was with Jesus. And yet, he did not fully understand or appreciate that divine truth. And even at the end, of Jesus' earthly ministry. Jesus looked at him and the others and said, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me? And we know that on that fateful night when Jesus was arrested, and falsely accused, that Peter stood afar off and three times said, I don't even know that man. I wasn't with him. I have no idea what you're talking about. I wasn't even close to him. Those are my words, not Peter's. He knew what it meant. He knew what it meant to be grounded in truth and still falter. And he knew that the people that he had ministered to would do the same thing. The biblical shepherd exhibits faithfulness in teaching the people of God. And so Peter says, I want you to consider it right, or I, I, I think it's right. And that word right is diakalos. It's where we get our word righteous. I think of it being righteous. Because his shepherd, his devotion as a shepherd made him faithful to the people that he was with and the people that he was ministering to because he was loyal to his Lord and doing what was right. So then we come to this term, in this tent. Or some of your Bibles will say, in this earthly dwelling. It comes from the Greek word skinomo. Skinomo, that's a great Greek word. You should get to know it. It's where we get our English word skin. Peter's saying, while I'm in this skin, right? We use skin for a lot of things. I have skin in the game, you know. Um, and, and, and so he, he's saying, here's this skinoma. Here's this tent. And what he's drawing attention to is the picture of the nomads that traveled around in the Middle East in those days, and they would dwell in tents. Have you ever dwelt in a tent? It's a lot of fun. We grew up, and we went to camping as, as a kid, my parents. Uh, they would take us uh, camping, and when we first started, um, we didn't have any tents or anything like that, so my uncle, who was into all that, all that outdoor stuff, let us borrow a tent, and we went camping, and uh, one of the first trips we went on was um, my mom 
and my aunt and my other aunt and uh, my, my eight kids, all under the age of, I'd say, 12, all went camping together. My dad and my two uncles stayed home. Right? So I, I think I was about eight at the time. I might have been seven or eight, but I, I don't remember much about that, but I do remember, remember know that um, it got cold in Michigan. It does that sometimes. Um, and it was the middle of summer, and it got cold, and our mothers sent us to the lake because they needed to clean up. I mean, what do boys do when they get near water? Yeah, you get in water. So I was swimming, and it was freezing cold. I remember that. Um, but I, that was one of my first experiences as, as camping, and I remember growing up doing that. And then my, my mom and dad bought a, a pop-up, one of those pop-up campers. That was great. That was fun. But then we got married, and we moved back to Michigan, and we decided, you know what? It's so much fun to camp. Let's take our kids camping. So we got a tent and all of the things that go with it, and we spent a lot of money on it, and we took our kids camping, and we were a little bit wiser in that we started this experience, and we went with some friends from church, and he was an expert camper. He knew everything there was about camping. So we went out there, and of course you get the tent, and you're like, how do I set this thing up, right? So you read the directions. Most men don't do that, but I was forced to read the directions. Um, and so we're set, we set it up so we know what we're doing, and we set the thing up and everything. We get it all going, and he says, is that where you're going to put your tent? We're like, yeah, why? He says, well, if it rains, all the water's coming in. And we're like, oh, where would you put it? He goes, over there. I was like, okay, so we tear it all down put it back up. And so we did, we, we did that, and we went with him. And lo and behold, we had a great time, wonderful time. And in, in this whole process, the one day it started raining like it did here the other day. We just started pouring. And I'm like, oh, no, it's raining. And he's like, oh, cool, it's raining. And he goes into his little campery thing that he has, this, this trailer that he has, John, like yours. He pulls out this tarp that he got from Big and Tall Tarps. This thing was massive. I think it would cover a football field. It was huge, and he gets this pole, and he sticks it up there, and he's like, whoa. And we, it was so tall and so big that you could put a campfire underneath there, and, and all of, we put a campfire, covered all of our tents, and I was like, all right. And then I'm like, okay, you know, I don't, I don't know what to do. I've never been camping before, and then I look around over, and he's over at my tent with a stick, and he's drawing He's pulling in the, I'm like, what is he writing in the sand, you know? And he's pulling it down through, and he was digging trenches so the water would stay away from our tent. I was like, oh, that guy's pretty smart. I should take him with me when I go camping. Well, then we decided that we're so smart now that we've been expert campers because we've gone three times and we know what we're doing. We'll go by by ourselves. So we went by ourselves over to the east coast or west coast of Michigan, Lake Silver Lake, um, and we, we set up put it up higher, learned from him, dug a little trench around there. We're all good. It's supposed to rain tonight. Hadn't rained on that side of, the, of, Lake Mich uh, of Michigan for a long time, but it's supposed to rain. Ah, we've got this covered. We're okay. Don't have to worry about it. It started raining. At about 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, I hear Lisa say, it's raining. I said, it's been raining for hours. She said, no. It's raining in the tent. I'm like, great. <laughs> so I'm like, ah. So she gets up. She goes out. She goes to sleep in the car because it was only raining on her side. I don't know why. <laughs> Pretty soon, Michael's awake. Dad, what? It's raining in here. I'm wet. Uh, go to the car. So I take him to the car. And I come back. Brandon's awake. Ah. Lauren was about two at this time. We have our own little, own little bed to sleep on. It had a little uh, siding so that she wouldn't fall out. She must have been younger than two. And, and so I take him to the car, and I come back, and she's, she's, sleep, she's still sleeping. And it's great. It's fine. And so I'm laying in there sleeping. He's, she's laying in there sleeping. And we're like, this is good and everything else. Pretty soon I wake up, and I look over at her, and she's not, she's not only sleeping, she's floating. 
And I'm like, I think it's time to get you up before you float out of here. So we got up, went into the car, and we're all sitting there looking at each other like, and it's like, what are we going to do? I said, let's go for a ride. They'll fall back asleep. So we went for a ride. It's still raining. We'll go for a ride, and they're all like, right? And we're all in our pajamas and everything else, and I'm like, she's like, what are we going to do now? And so we'd gone to, up the road miles and miles and miles. I said, let's stop and get some breakfast. She's like, we're in our pajamas. All right, we'll never see these people again. So we go in, <laughs> we go in and get some, go in and get some pajamas, go in and get some breakfast, come back down. And uh, it's, by that time, it stopped raining, and it was beautiful. It was a beautiful morning, gorgeous morning. Everything was soaked. Everything was soaked. We're in this little town that has one laundromat. So we picked up everything, and we're like, okay, let's go to this laundromat. So we go to this laundromat, and guess what? We weren't the only ones that were in there. <laughs> Everybody in town that had been camping was in there. And uh, so I was like, okay, well, let's just drive around for a little bit, and, and maybe we'll, get, we'll pick up things and go home. And she's like, no, we got two more days. We're going to stay. I was like, okay, well, we got to get this stuff dry. So we go by this little mom and pop motel and she looks in there and there's one person coming out of the laundry room and she she goes pull in there so I pulled in there and they're like she told the lady what was going on and she's like oh yeah lose, use our dryers honey it's fine so we got to do that for free it was pretty cool um so so here here's here, here's the here's the moral behind that story number one you got to be prepared so the next thing I did is I went out and bought a huge tarp and put it up. It didn't rain the rest of the time, but I was prepared. Peter says, you know what? You got to be prepared. You got to always be prepared. You got to be ready. You got to be faithful to the end. You got to be preparing and be faithful. Because why? Because, listen, that's not our home. That was a tent. Do you want to live in a tent all your life? No. We don't want to live in a tent. We want to go home. We want to be home. I had a longing to just pack up and go home. But we understand that this tent, this thing that we have right here, it's not permanent. It's not permanent. God has given this to us, and he wants us to take care of it. That's why he tells us that he's dwelling inside of us. In the Old Testament, God dwelt in the temple. In the New Testament, God dwells in, our, in, in the temple that he's given to us. And we need to take care of that temple. But listen, w this temple is not permanent. Aren't you glad that it's not permanent? I, I don't know about you, but I, I find it painful. This temple, as I get older. I'm sure I'm, it's just me. But this temple breaks down. It's not forever. And so he says in here, he says, I think it's right as long as I'm in this tent to do what? To stir up, to stir you up by reminding you. That's a, a compound form of the verb diagero, which means to arouse completely, to thoroughly awaken. To get you out of your drowsiness. To get you to wake up. You ask the question, why isn't the revival here with the old people? Because we need to wake up. We need to wake up. And that's what he's saying. You need to wake up. You need to become spiritually alert to the things of God. Believers, we, believe, we can become sluggish. We can, we can fail to be alert. We can fail to be clear-minded. We can believe the lies that are out there and let it come in and just cause us to be like, oh, it's no big deal. Um, I can't remember the name of it now. It's ACJU, I think is what it is. Don't go to ACLU. That's an anti-Christian liberal organization. Um, ACJ, I think it is, put out a thing today that out in the land of fruits and, I'm sorry, out in the land of California, fruits and nuts, um, the biggest nut of them all, Gavin Newsom, has proposed a bill that is going to be passed that if a, a unwanted 
fetal substance comes out of a um, birthing person that they can keep it for 28, up to 28 days and then they can get rid of it if they want. So let me, let me define that for you and let, let you understand what you're saying. If a baby is born tw- and for 28 days, up to tw- the 28th day, you can murder your baby. That's exactly what he's saying. And many good Christian people out there are in, enraged with this, and we should be. What is wrong with us that we are, as a society, giving in to the things of this world and giving in to the things of Satan and not standing up and saying, no, that's wrong. There's no other way about it. It is wrong. We've murdered 64 million babies. We don't need to have a 28-day. And by the way, don't think it stops with just young babies, too. They're coming after older people, too. So Peter says, let me remind you what we're really about. We're about the gospel of Jesus. Yes. Yes, the gospel of Jesus is about love. It is about the greatest of love of all. I mean, we just celebrated Valentine's. Well, you all just celebrated Valentine's Day. Mine was in Mexico. Um, We are to love one another. We are to love the ungodly the unsaved. We are to do that. But there is also the truth that we need to stand for truth. Murder of the unborn, murder of babies, murder of elderly is a sin. Just the same as gossip. And we need to stand against all of that because it's truth. And then, uh, f- so, so be faithful, because I think Peter has in mind here th- about, uh, about his own time when he was falling asleep and Jesus saying, just watch and pray, watch and pray for me, watch and pray. And Jesus saying the same thing in our day, that we need to be aroused to be able to watch and pray. And then number four is we need to have brevity. Verses 14 and 15, he says, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent. Just our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. We need to know for certain. Know that the laying aside of this earthly uh, dwelling, Peter says, my earthly dwelling is imminent. Our death is imminent. Uh, Peter believed that his death was clear and near. And then, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just turn there. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says this. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 and 2, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. And we know that's true because Jesus told us, I'm going, guys. He told the disciples, I'm leaving. And I'm going, and even though I'm going, you know where I'm going. My, I'm going to my father's house. He has many mansions, a place for you. He's got a place for you. If you just believe that I am the way, the truth, and the life, you know that you can follow me. And Peter has come to the end of his life, and he says, it is imminent. My time is soon. My time is swift. James tells us that our life is but a vapor. We're here today and gone tomorrow. Death is assured for all of us. Jesus had indicated to Peter that his death would be rather sudden. Where do you find that, Pastor Kevin? Well, turn to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. The last, um, the, the, the last chapter of the Gospel of John chapter 21 40 years before Peter is writing this and before Peter is going to be gone, Jesus tells him and he's restored him. In verse 15, he says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, Son of Jonah, do you love me? 
And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And we get that. We read that over and over and over again. A lot of times we just stop right there and we say, okay, that was great. That was good for Peter. He's been restored and things are going on. But Jesus has something else for him. And look at verse 18. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, to you, Simon Peter, when you were younger, you girded yourself, you walked where you wished. But when you're old, Peter, you'll stretch out your hands. Another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. And as he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Peter, follow me. Follow me. These are words of a coming martyrdom for Peter. And he predicted, Peter, you are going to be executed. Somebody else is going to carry you and, and gird out your hands. You're, you're going to stretch out your hands and die, signifying that he would die by a crucifixion. Peter had lived another four decades. He had been faithful to feed the sheep like Jesus had told him to do, knowing at, at any moment it could be the end for him. He wants to swiftly talk to these people and tell them about Jesus. And tradition records, recorded by Eusebius, one of the uh, uh, first century uh, theologians, historians attest that Peter was crucified upside down at his own request because he felt unworthy to die as his Lord and Savior did. And so in view of the brevity of his life and minister, Peter is relentlessly diligent to remind believers of truth because our world is full of false teachers in the church and outside the church. So back in Second Peter chapter 1, he uses the term departure, exodus, to refer to his death because the word means leaving one place to go to another. He says, I'm ready to depart. I'm ready to go. Peter was not concerned that his audience remember him. He was concerned that they remember the truth of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he truly understood the urgency, the kindness, the faithfulness, the brevity of ministry. As the leader of the twelve, he wanted believers to avoid the hazards of being spiritual, spiritually ne negligent. And so he labored diligently, preaching and teaching truth against false teachers. He des desires to leave a final will and testament to remind saints of the greatness of salvation the blessedness of assurance and to make certain that false doctrine does not rob you of blessings that you deserve no, that you get through him because of your spiritual heritage so the question this morning are you on board? are you on board the train that never gets derailed? piloted by the greatest of pilots whose name is Jesus. Are you on that train? He purchased your ticket. You just have to pick it up. You don't need any baggage. Lay aside all your sins, all your weights, and just get on board because it's trucking, it's rolling. He's the greatest engineer. Are you ready to depart? Don't miss it. Don't be late. Just get on board. Where are we going? There's only one place to go. How are we going to get there? Only one way to get there. The way, the truth, and the life. 
Nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Bow your heads. Close your eyes with me, please. You're here this morning and you don't know the Lord as your Savior. You're waiting on. Time is ticking away. You don't want to be left here when he comes back. I want to take some time this moment and look inside your own heart and say to God, God, I'm a sinner. You're not alone. We all are. We're saved from our sin by the grace of Jesus Christ and him alone. So ask him to come into your life. Ask him to save you. Repent of your sin. Tell him that you're sorry for your sin. Tell him that you, you, you agree with him that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that nobody comes to the Father but through him. Because he's the only way. And once you do that, let somebody know. I did that today. I asked Jesus to save me. Let's all stand. I'm going to pray. Lori, I want you to play through something. And as she's playing, um, the altar will be open for you. If you need to come and give something over to the Lord, if you need to know Christ as your Savior, I'd love to take, take time to share with you how you can know for sure. Father, thank you for your love to us. Thank you that you are the way the truth, the life, and that no one can come to the Father except through you. And so I pray, Father, that in the name of Jesus, Lord, that if there's one here who doesn't know you, that today they'd give their heart to you. And I pray, Father, for believers today, that we would sense the urgency in our own hearts to be revived and renewed in our church and I pray Father that you would help us to realize that our time is short and that you have called us to be faithful to the end and so I pray that you would help us be faithful to the end and that we would show the loving kindness and grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ but we would also make people aware of the truth of how God feels about sin no matter what kind of sin that is. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. In Jesus' name. Tell the world about you. We thank you for it. Thank you for your love in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. All right, thank you, Lori. We're, yeah.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, sister. Amen. 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 All right. Let me give you a prayer, uh, prayer request and announcements. We have a business meeting immediately afterwards, so don't go anywhere. We'll get through it eventually, um, hopefully soon, or rather than later. Good News Club, the buses are due back next, um, next week. Uh, make sure you get those filled in. Continue praying for Good News Club. We have like 30-some coming every week, 36. Fred, Fred does the math, but he has to take his shoes off, and it kind of gets bad around here when he does that. Uh, there is a self-defense class next Saturday, uh, 11 to 2. Cost us 20 bucks. If you can't afford it, just let us know. But we want every, all of you women to be, uh, to be here. I'm telling you, I saw a video today of a young lady who was working out in, um, I guess, her apartment building. She was working out in her apartment building. She saw somebody who was knocking on the door wanting to come in. She'd seen him before. She thought that he, he lived there. She let him in, and this man, this man attacked her. And, and, brother, she went ballistic on him. Oh, man, she went ballistic. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, it, it didn't matter. She, she didn't have a key, but she had fingernails and, and knees. And, I mean, she, and I, I, I almost felt sorry for the guy. And then I was like, no, I don't feel, I hope they locked him in there and locked, throw away the key. Um, men's Bible study tomorrow. Men's Bible study tomorrow. Make sure that you understand that. Men's Bible study tomorrow. Lesson number f- five. Uh, for those of you who are just coming back from Puerto Rico, that's Cinco. Um, shoebox Ministry, she left us uh, Friday at 6.30. Um, be in prayer for, let me see what else I got here. Oh, be in prayer for, Matt, will you do me a favor? On the table back there, there's a bunch of these. Will you go bring them in for us? Thank you. You're all right. I don't care what your brother said about you. Um, be in prayer for Charlie. Uh, Charlie's in general. Uh, CAMC general he's had another stroke Um, he's having some complications from that he's um, unable to to walk without a walker and and things so be in prayer for Charlie as they try and help him and figure things out Laura Chapman is home recovering her surgery went well Uh, continue to pray for the Van Adders and Miss Lewis Um, and also pray for um, Donna Smith She's worn out her pacemaker and needs to go back and get another, uh, need to get a first one. So she's worn out the original one that God's given to her, and now she's got to get a pacemaker put in Thursday. Thursday. So be in prayer for Donna um, as she has that. All right. Well, anything else? Wait. Yeah, okay. Just hold on to those. Amen. Jean Ann. Okay. Okay. Jean Ann's going back to have her liver checked again? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. June Tucker. All right. Brother Bill, young man. Your your daughter Sharon. Is that? Oh. Okay, all right. Remember Sharon Thompson in your prayers, please. Yeah, Heather. Let's pray, and then we're not going to sing the doxology today. I didn't tell you that. Sorry, but we're going to do that. We're going to go right into our business meeting. So if you're a member, you can be seated. If you're not a member, you're welcome to leave, or you can just stay put, whatever you care. I don't care. Uh, Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you that um, we have needs um, because, Father, that just helps us be more dependent 
on the one who can answer our needs. Um, Lord, and thank you that you are so loving to us and so gracious and so kind. Um, Lord, we don't deserve any of that. Um, but out of your goodness, you show us who you are through those um, attributes that you have. And we experience it every single day. Um, Lord, we find that your, your mercies are new every morning. And, uh, Father, we praise you for him. Thank you for how good you are. Uh, Father, we continue to pray for revival in our hearts and in our lives. Pray, Father, for all those that have been mentioned, Jean Ann and, and uh, Tammy's aunt, uh, Father, for Charlie, for Laura, uh, for, for the uh, Venander family, Lord, and, and Lord, for, for Donna, and, uh, Lord, just for everyone here that is, has a need, Lord, we pray for them and that you would encourage them. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. All right.